to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be there for a few moments. Really, Matthew 28 is where I'll spend a lot of time, even though I have a lot more scripture. Listen, um, one of the reasons I give you these is so you can take notes, because I realize there's a lot of times there'll be things that I say that you don't have opportunity to write it all down. You won't have, if they put a scripture up here, you won't be able to remember it by, unless you're in Bible quiz and you memorize it. But the point is, is go to, and use notes, use your phone. I, I don't, I don't care how it is, but if we're disciples, then what happens is we need to hear and know and understand the instructions. And so um, we give you notes or the ability to take notes on the back of your bulletin so that you can write down um, those scripture so that you can go look at them in, in your own personal time and different things and ask the Lord to bring that to you. But I, I began a series last week, The Church in the 21st Century. Um, if you missed that, you can go online and look at that. But uh, let, me, let me give you the cliffs notes to that. A relevant church is, is what I preached last week. A relevant church. Um, and I said this, Jesus is always relevant to society, so his church should be relevant. I'm waiting for all the amens and shouts. Ah! I heard a lot of that the other In fact, I was doing some of that last week. I was doing a lot of crying last week when, after the end of the game. I had prayed and fasted. And, but a relevant church, we should be relevant because Jesus is always relevant. The world would say, oh, no, this God thing is irrelevant. Yeah, you let, you let something tragic happen in their life, and who are they going to cry out to? Well, I don't believe in God. Oh, there'll be somebody... That they'll say that, but in their, in their moment of crisis, they're crying out, trying to see if there's a, a loophole, <laughs> seeing if there's a way. But listen, a, the church should be relevant. The next thing is, is a relevant church fully follows Christ. And a relevant church helps people encounter Jesus. A relevant church helps people encounter Jesus. We help people encounter Jesus even when they don't know that they need to encounter Jesus. Do you realize that? You, do you realize that Jesus, in talking to the Samaritan woman, she didn't realize that she needed to have an encounter with God. She's just, she's just been married five times and living with a man now, and she's coming to the well to get water, and the reason she's coming at that time is because all the other ladies wouldn't be there to, to talk down to her, to be mad at her, or whatever the situation was. But, she, but Jesus understood that she needed an encounter with him. <laughs> And so the church needs to help people encounter Jesus. Do we have to do it? Oh, they only encounter Jesus like this. No. Listen, they better encounter Jesus wherever we go. I'm going to say that again because you need to get it. People ought to encounter Jesus wherever we go. Because you and I are the church in a mobile unit. <laughs> we move along. And we go where the Holy Spirit would lead us and put, he puts us in places so that we might be a light. And we're talking about the church in the 21st century. But I want to take a few moments this morning to preach a sermon that, that uh, this may be the most important sermon of all of them. Uh, but I've just entitled it, Who's the Boss? Who's the Boss? Isn't that always the question? Who's the boss? Who's, who's in charge here? I, I was in youth ministry, or I was in youth ministry almost 13 years. We were in Chickasha, Oklahoma, and one night we had a passionate service where we burned um, things that were keeping us and hindering us from following God fully. There were some CDs and, and different things that kids put into this barrel that we burnt. The problem was is we started it inside, which wasn't a big deal at the time. We put it inside, and it got a little smoky toward the end, so I told told some of our leaders, take that big barrel and put it out on the landing because we were up on the second floor. The only problem was is when you did that, it went, when it got out and it got exposed to the air, <laughs> and we weren't far off the highway and somebody driving down the highway called the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm meeting with my staff afterwards. We're talking about service and how it went. Oh, wasn't that awesome? Those kids coming up and responding. And, oh, and we get a knock at the door in one of the classrooms. And here comes the fire fireman. Who's responsible? <laughs> I'm like, oh, she is. <laughs> I said... I am. Well, who's this? I said, I'm so sorry. I'm from Texas and we burn everything. Because <laughs> I was in Oklahoma. 
Uh, he didn't think it was as funny as I did, but um, who's the boss? There was a young husband who was henpecked, and he was going to counseling about the problem, and the doctor told him, you don't have to let your wife bully you. Go home and show her you're the boss. The young man got home, slammed the door, shook his fist in his wife's face and growled, from now on, you're going to take orders from me. When I get home from work, I want my supper on the table. I want my clothes laid out. I'll be going out with the boys, and you'll be staying at home. And another thing, do you know who's going to be tying my tie? Yes, she said, the undertaker. <laughs> Father, help us to recognize today who's the boss in our lives. God, give us ears to hear and high eyes to see and hearts to understand. Lord, because the church is relevant in the 21st century. And so help us to recognize who we are and whose we are. And we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may, not, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. First of all, if you don't know, God did not say you cannot touch it. That was not what he said. He said, do not eat it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. I ought to come up with a voice, change my voice. No, you will not die. No, anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> the serpent said to the woman, in fact, God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit, some of, the, of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made linen loincloths for themselves. The story of the fall of man. The serpent, Satan, comes and manipulates Eve. That, that in and of itself is a whole other story or a whole other sermon we could use. But, but I want to focus on this thought in that, that Satan's scheme is always to get us to question God. That's his scheme. Did he really say, oh, that's not what he really meant. He said that, but that's not what he meant. Right? He wants us to begin to doubt his word, his commands, the intentions that God has for us. If, if God really loved you, he wouldn't care if you did that because it makes you feel good because you like this or you like that. He, he, he just wants to take all the fun away from you. And see, when we begin to doubt what God's intentions are for our lives, then we begin to lack or we, we begin to doubt his authority in our life. It's an age-old question. Who's the boss? Who's the boss? I remember when, when we were on staff over at Abundant Life in Grapevine and we had one of our students happen to be over the house as late, probably on a Friday evening, and, and Riker wasn't even in school yet. And, and it was late, so, I, so it's time to go to bed. So I, I say to Riker, Riker, go to bed. And she proceeds to walk over to the couch and say to me, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> well, I can promise you I changed her mind. <laughs> she realized that I was the boss and she wasn't. But it's an age-old question from little to... And listen, we, 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 we can say, oh, that's so cute, that's so funny. Listen, it is funny at three, but not at 16. And if you don't deal with it at three, you'll face it again at 16. And so that's a whole nother sermon as well. 
But Bishop Tudor Bismarck makes this response. He says the offense to God's plan wasn't just eating the forbidden fruit, but in giving up the authority that God had given to mankind. It wasn't just that they ate the apple. It's then they gave the author- their authority. They handed it over to Satan. And Satan then became the ruler of the world, the, wor- the ruler of our society. And they just handed it over for a piece of fruit, which would begin to create a struggle Our struggle for authority in Genesis chapter 3, the same passage, verse 16, God speaking to to Eve, he says, he said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear, bear children in anguish. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will dominate you. In other words, when it says your hus- when you'll have a desire for your husband, it's not saying that, oh, I just love him so much more. No, the desire is, is that you would be the boss. That was the contention. That became the struggle. Who would lead? Who would rule? And and God says, he will dominate you. I'm not sure that I like it, that particular word in in the, the Holman version where he says that he will dominate you or he'll rule over you as we read it in other. But here's the thing. It's not that they would, that, that he would, uh, that she would desire him is that she would desire to have his place of authority. There would be a struggle for that authority. So our struggle with sin really comes down to who's the boss in our lives. Let's, let's just make this as simple as we can. Sin is just a struggle. Now, society comes along and society tells us, um, if it feels right, then, then we can do it. Um, society will say, there are no moral standards except the ones that we set or the ones that we desire to live by. Society says, I was born this way. And can I tell you something? That is the truth. We were all born with the sin complex. We are all born with, with the intention and, and a slant towards sin because that's, that's our flesh that's speaking. But if we say, Lord, you're the boss, if we say well, you, you have all authority in my life, then you know what we do? We don't look at how I feel, how it makes me feel, what I think is right. What I do is I come to him and I say, Lord, all authority is in your hand and, my, and you're the boss of my life, so I submit to you. So in Matthew chapter 28, see, we, the question has to be answered, who's the boss of our lives? Who has the authority in my life? Who will run or rule my life? In Matthew 28, Jesus says this in talking to the disciples. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus makes the declaration that all authority is his on heaven or in heaven and on earth. Okay, just a little bit, get a little bit of a picture here. In Genesis, Adam and Eve give away their authority. Jesus comes and he regains or he restores authority. Now, now listen, here's, here's what the enemy, here's what Satan tried to do. The sneaky snake. We see in Luke 4 the temptation of Jesus. And Satan says, he takes him up to the mountain. It says, that, in SRV it says it this way. He takes him up on the mountain and he says, look at all the kingdoms. If you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the authority and all its glory. See, because Satan's scheme was to steal away and destroy God's plan. But Jesus' response, it is written, you shall, not, you shall worship only God, God only. And so instead of him going and taking authority by his means, he waited until God came and gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. So Jesus came and he's making this, he's making this uh, thought known to them, this declaration to them is after his death and after his resurrection and before he would ascend into, into heaven. And the scripture says that he sits at the right hand of the Father. So in making disciples, the first truth that they must understand, that we must understand, that Christ has all authority. He's the boss. In Colossians 1.18, it says, He is the head of the body, the church. So as followers of Jesus, we must fully recognize His authority 
in our lives. Second thing is, Jesus came to restore God's authority to us and for us. Uh, The other thing that we see in this is that Jesus came not only to restore authority, but he came to release his authority. Do you realize that? Jesus came to release his authority in our life so that we would minister not in our own ability, but in the authority and the power of Christ. So God, God has established authority. Do you realize this, that God has established authorities in our lives? Riker learned that without me ever having to quote to her Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, 1. I didn't go to Riker and say, now, Riker, Scripture says, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. (laughs) We had another kind of talk. (laughs) I talked on the south side of the northbound train. (laughs) <laughs> but the point is, is, is we communicated because God has established authority in our lives. Sons and daughters, Ma, God has placed your parents in your life. Well, I don't like them. Well, you know, some, sometimes they don't like you either. <laughs> we just have to get over it. <laughs> but authority is there to be a blessing to us. Another thing we see in Romans chapter 13, um, Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. So we recognize that God has even established governments and those in leadership to be a blessing to us. God has established his authority through them. We see also in the church that there's spiritual leadership. We see it in Hebrews, but also again in Ephesians 4. And it says, And Jesus gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints. You know, for there to be training and instruction, somebody has to recognize they have authority. And listen, it's not, I'm not saying that so I want you to know that I'm the authority in the house. Listen, Jesus didn't come and rule that way. He didn't, he didn't lead that way. In fact, Jesus said, if you desire to be the greatest, then you must be the least and be a servant. And so understand this morning, I have authority because Christ has given it to me in my, because of the office that I carry. But he's also called me to carry that in humility and to serve. And so there's authority even in the spiritual realm. We see this this morning as well in 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. The word has authority. That's why we would come this morning and we'd come on the other Sunday mornings and we'd say, hey, listen, open up your word and turn to this passage or turn to this passage. Why? Because the word has authority in our lives if we're a believer. I also say this, the word also has authority even if you're not a believer. Do you realize that? People, I don't agree with that. Well, that's fine. There'll be one day you will. (laughs) Because the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe in him or not. So God has established authority. He has given authority to his church to advance his kingdom. Now listen, let's not lose sight of this because we're, build, we're building a little bit of something over these, these several weeks that we're talking about this. We're, built, we're talking about the church in the 21st century. In the 21st century. And God has a place. He has a relevant place for us. And we need to understand who we are and whose we are and what we have so that we can do all that he's called us to do. So God has given uh, the authority to Jesus and Jesus has given that authority or released that authority to his church to advance his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. Luke 10, 1 and 2 says this, After this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. In verse 9 of that same passage, he says, He told them, Heal the, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. He released his authority into their lives. Now, here's, here's the thing that you've got to understand. 
if you continue to read these passages, it says that they came back rejoicing. The 70 came back rejoicing. Even demons are, are accountable or subjected to our name. And Jesus said, don't, don't, don't be, in a sense, he says, don't be gloating. Don't be celebrating that. Celebrate this, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But listen, as long as he was on the earth at that moment, when they operated in that, they were operating in his authority. Here's the thing about those passages. He never took that authority away from the church. He never took that authority away. He said, okay, you used it for once. Now nah, it's, it's back to me. He released that so that we would minister under his authority with his power. Which is why, that's why I believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important to us. Because he says you will receive power. What's that power? To walk in his authority. Matthew 28. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And because all authority has been given to me. Listen, this, this, we can read it like this. Because all authority has been given to Jesus. He says to them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them, commanding them to observe everything that I have taught you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Can I tell you something this morning? The, the authority that Jesus was saying that he had was the authority that he gave the church to go and to make disciples. The most important thing that we need to understand as disciples, who's the boss? You and I are no longer the boss. We give up our life. We die to sin so that we might gain life. And the only way that we gain life is not because, well, I'm going to do it my way. Do it your way and you'll face the consequences. Do it his way and you'll reap the rewards. And so by the authority of Christ, we advance his kingdom. We will not fully operate in our authority if we fail to be submitted to his authority. There are people because they're charismatic or because they, they understand how to organize or whatever and they do great things. You go, man, I want that power. But you look at their lives and it's vacant. It's, it's empty. It's void of really what God desires for them. Yes, they can stand up and they can draw crowds or whatever, but the, the power and the authority of Christ is not truly in them. So we have to understand that in order for us to operate in His authority, we have to be submitted to His authority. There was a Department of Water Resource representative stop at a ranch here in Texas and, and he gets out to talk with the old rancher and he tells the rancher, I need to inspect your ranch for your water allocation. The old rancher says, okay, but don't go in the field, that field over there. The water representative says, Mr., I have the authority of the federal government with me. See this card? This card means I'm allowed to go wherever I wish on any agricultural land. No questions asked or answered. Have I made myself clear? Do you understand? The old rancher nodded politely and went about his chores. Later, the old rancher hears, hears loud screams and sees the water rep running for his life. And close behind him is the rancher's bull. The bull is gaining with every step. The, re the rep is clearly ter terrified. So the old rancher immediately throws down his tools, runs to the fence, and yells at the top of his lungs, Your card! Show him your card! <laughs> Listen, authority is one thing, but if you don't operate with the right power with that authority, he's just going to get you run over by a bunch of bull. <laughs> See, in order to fully operate in his authority, we must be submitted to his authority. Jesus, we see in Matthew 8, the story of the centurion's faith. It says, when he entered Capernaum, Jesus, a centurion, came to him pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. Jesus replies to him, I will come and heal him. Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be cured. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, I assure you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. 
See, we need to understand that Jesus has all authority and how that authority flows so that we can fully function in the authority of Christ, the authority that he's given to the church. The problem is, here, here's a problem. The church in the 21st century has to get this revelation, has to get this understanding that Christ has given us the authority not only to live by, but to minister in. You know, I, I said this last week, when the church, the, church, the, the church is relevant when we're fully following Christ, listen, if we're not working and operating in his authority, we're not fully following Christ. The church in the 21st century has to recognize not only is he the boss, but he has all authority and we are submitted to it. See, the church in the 21st century, the church in the 21st century is one that is relevant and fulfilling Christ's will is one that is submitted to his authority. The greatest question we'll ever, we have to answer is, who's the boss? And can I tell you something this morning, as simple as that may sound, and, and maybe uh, the, the truth is this, is that he is the boss. He is my boss. If we follow Christ, he is our boss, and we walk in his authority. And when we walk in his authority and in his power, then we can do what Christ did. I believe the church in the 21st century has to be a church that does what Christ did. Father, convict us. Father, challenge us. Father, help us that we may fully follow you, that we may fully come into submission to your authority and to your power. And Father, we love you. We thank you in your precious name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord praise.